Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, February 21st, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well today. Well, it's been a very busy week, and uh, it's been a lot going on. Uh, we have a jam-packed show uh, today. Our guest is going to be uh, Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And he's going to talk about his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. A lot of people have been waiting for that new book to come out. I know I have been as well. And he also has another book that's about to come out in uh, about two weeks or so uh, about his time with Muhammad, with Muhammad Ali, the greatest of all time. All right. So. Uh, we're going to jump into that here in just a minute. Then in our second hour, we're going to discuss the press conference that took place uh, on Saturday, February 20, uh, Saturday, February 20th, uh, that revealed new evidence in the assassination of Malcolm X. You know, we talked about this on our Friday show, uh, new evidence uh, from a, a former uh, uh, New York, uh, New York uh, City police uh, Detective uh, Ray Wood uh, revealed information that the uh, New York Police Department and the FBI conspired in the killing of Malcolm X, allegedly. So there was a press conference on Saturday, February 20th, and uh, it was held by Benjamin Crump, uh, Attorney Benjamin Crump and uh, two other attorneys. Uh, and they revealed uh, this information, but also information involving infiltration of uh, core Congress of racial equality, uh, Congress of racial uh, equality, as well as the Black Panther Party for self defense. So we're going to talk about that in the second hour. Okay. Uh, also, Dr. David M. Hotel is going to be a guest speaker uh, on Tuesday, February twenty third, twenty twenty one. Tuesday, February twenty third, twenty twenty one, eight p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the online course that I teach: Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so we'll talk about that as well. We're going to post a link here on the thread of the broadcast. You can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, uh, for more information about the online course and and uh, to register. You can register right at our, our website. It's an eight week, sixteen hour online course. Meets Tuesdays, eight p.m to uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, now on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow the people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you, ha what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history, politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, to 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, also visit uh, our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can sign up for the email newsletter there as well. If you want to support the African History Network, you can uh, uh, support through Cash App or PayPal, dollar sign, the AHN Show, through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN Show, S-H-O-W, through Cash App. Be sure to type in the whole thing, dollar sign, the AHN Show, through Cash App, and then also through PayPal, PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. It helps us. So we're here six days a week. It helps us keep broadcasting six days a week. We're here Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time, and still on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time as well. All right. So with that, uh, let's bring on Dr. David M. Hotel author of the book the first americans were africans documented evidence okay we're going to get his audio straight because we want you to hear every word that he has to say uh so his new book the first americans were africans revisited uh is going to be out sometime in march 2021 
Um, I've been talking to them, you know, so I've been giving you updates on this. It has about 200 pages of additional research and it's going to blow you away. Now, when I first found out about, uh, when I first found out about him in, uh, it's about 2011, I think it was, I told him that his book, the first Americans with Africans documented evidence could single handedly, could single handedly, uh, destroy white supremacy and racism. The book is phenomenal. He has um, in the intro, uh, he has a part, uh, short part written by Dr. Malefe Kethi Asante, if I remember correctly. I have the book here. And uh, also Dr. Clyde Winters uh, has uh, some information, he wrote a part of it in the introduction, okay? Um, so it's, extre it's an extremely important book. He stands on the shoulders of of uh, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, who wrote, they came before Columbus, they came before Columbus. And, um, you know, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema wrote that that book came out in 1976 originally, they came before Columbus. So it, this is a good topic to discuss during African-American History Month. And one of the reasons why it's so important is because, you know, I know people go through a lot of uh, time, let me know when we have a straight jailer. I know people go through a lot of uh, uh, time and effort to organize the African American History Month celebrations, but uh, a lot of it focuses on runaway slaves and slavery and, and things like this. And so many people want to know about our history before slavery. So many people want to know about our history before slavery. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade and slavery is important, but you also have to understand a chronology of history and a, and a timeline of history. And, and oftentimes um, the history of African people prior to enslavement is not discussed. That's why the understanding the history of the Moors in the book uh, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, is so important. Uh, so this is his book here. We have a picture of him up and we're going to bring him on. We're getting his audio straight. We want you to be able to hear everything very clearly. Uh, so on Amazon, this book goes for something like nine hundred dollars. It's out of print. His new book is coming out very soon. You'll be able to get it. It's on Amazon. It's not going to be nine hundred dollars. OK, uh, so it's, it's going to be uh, extremely important. It's going to be an extremely important uh, piece of work uh, in, in, in his first book. Some of the things that um, that he discusses are Africans began sailing in the Americas at least 60,000 years ago. Uh, he mentions the article from the New York Times in February 2010. The New York Times uh, newspaper reported humans began sailing 130,000 years ago, according to uh, evidence found on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean. Now, I talked about that discovery in my online course on Tuesday. And you see, this is this is my file folder because uh, I have a file folder with information. Uh, about Dr. David M. Hotep and from him and uh, articles and things like this. So when he and I talk, he tells me about articles. I put that in the file folder. So then when I interview him, I just pull my file folder out and I, I've got the information here. Um, There's one thing that he, he told me about. It was a new discovery. Now, the, one of the good things he did for his first, first book, and I hope he does it for his second book. And uh, when I bring him on in just a minute here, we're getting his audio straight. I'll find out about it. He put together something called controversial items in the first Americans where Africans documented evidence. So his first book at his website, uh, and I know he's building a new one, uh, he had something called controversial items. And it lists uh, some bullet points about his book that will blow you away. And how many controversial items is this? It's 28, 28 controversial items. So all this stuff. I printed out, I archive it. I have thousands of articles, things like this. I'm trying to clean up. And at last week for one of the shows, you all saw it. I, I, after I got off the air, we finished the show maybe 1, 1 a.m. I spent two or three hours throwing stuff away, cleaning stuff up. Then, then, the, then the next night for the show, I couldn't find anything. So <laughs> I got to figure that out. <laughs> Once I clean up, now I got to figure out where everything else is again. I couldn't find books or anything. <laughs> I call myself cleaning up, do stuff out. But anyway, that's that's the way it goes. So hopefully he put something together like this for his second book. So uh, back in probably about uh, 2015, I printed up this article from the New York Times. 
uh, discoveries challenge beliefs on humans' arrival in the Americas. Discoveries challenge beliefs on humans' arrival in the Americas. So as you all watch, you can pull up this article as well. This is from New York Times. This is from March 27, 2014. I was talking to him one day and he told me that there was new evidence that came out in South America that pushes the date back of Africans being in South America. Originally, according to his first book, it was 56,000 years ago. OK, this pushes it back at least 100,000 years. All right. Um, and this is from March 27, 2014. And in the uh, in the article here, it talks about. Uh, Dr. Uh, Guidon. Dr. Guidon remains defiant about her findings at her home on the grounds of a museum. She found it to focus on the discoveries in Serra de Capavara. Uh, she said she believed that humans had reached these plateaus even earlier, around 100,000 years ago, and might have come and might have come not over land from Asia, but by boat from Africa. OK, so as I've said before, uh, when these archaeological discoveries come out and I'll pull up the article from The New York Times that, that I show in my class, because I know Dr. David M. Hotel is going to reference that. So I want to be a good student and uh, be prepared. OK, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go ahead and pull this up. We have his audio straightened yet, uh, Jalen. We still working on that. Yeah. Is it straight? Is his audio straight? Okay. All right. Uh, so we want to welcome back to the uh, African History Network show, Dr. David M. Hotel. All right, brother. How you doing tonight? Um, I'll have as good as you, brother. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So uh, I gave uh, people a, a overview and a preview, and we know that uh, your new book, uh, The First Americans of Africans uh, Revisited, is coming out. So Tell tell people uh, the premise of your new book. And Dr. David M. M Hotep also has a PhD in ancient African uh, civilizations as well, ancient African history. Uh, uh, tell people the premise of your of your new book. Okay, and uh, after we get finished with this, it'll be the PhD in uh, nutrition. I'm talking about Ali. So oh, okay. today um, we're talking about we're talking about. Uh, the first Africans uh, here in America. And, you know, um, we were all taught in 1492, Columbus said, Ozen Boo. And um, uh, that that was found to be something wrong. And then they said in 1619 that the first a uh, Africans were brought to America by the, by the English. Mm -hmm. And um, we were supposed to believe this, and, and what we did until some uh, good scholars uh, started going back and digging more and getting more evidence. So I have evidence now that, that there are Africans in Central America between 250 and 325,000 years ago in Central America. Okay, in, because, on that, bro. okay, in Central America between 250,000 and mm -hmm. 300, and what is it? 325. 325,000. 325,000. Okay, in Central America. Okay, where in Central America? Okay. Um, let's see. Now, when they came over the, in the boat, in those boats, uh, they would come into. They wouldn't hit South America. They wouldn't hit North America. They would hit uh, Central America, like. And we're talking um, Mexico. Okay. So in an area that they call Mexico. Okay. So what? Uh, what? When did this? this they were any Mexicans. Right. Right. Before they were any Mexicans. So when did this discovery right. take place? When when, when? when was this discovery unearthed? 250,000 years ago took place. No, no, no. I mean, when did they find when did they find out this information? When there was a discovery that was made. So it was an archaeological discovery that was made that that led them to come to the conclusion that there was an African presence in Mexico 250,000 years ago. When 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 was this right. information unearthed? How, how did you come about this? I came about it um, online. I was searching through some things and got to this article, and uh, uh, that's what they said. They didn't say when they found it okay. and uh, what year or whatever they found it, but they just gave the years that the uh, people were, their their, their uh, bones and, and shovels and, and buildings and different things that show 250 to 325. Okay, so this is, uh, 
this is this is going to be in your new book also absolutely okay now when does your when does your new book come out um as soon as those people finish uh, <laughs> uh i've got i've got editors working on it now right it, it should be out within a month within, within a month from now uh, or earlier okay so basically by basically by the end of march 2021 uh, the new book should be out. Right. Okay. The new book however, is. However, yeah. in, in the next couple of weeks, my my um, book, the other book, see that other, the book we're talking about is over four hundred pages. Right. This uh, book that I just finished uh, is about Muhammad or Muhammad Ali and myself, and that is only sixty pages. So right. that's going to be out. Uh, we're we're going we're going to come to that in just a minute. The book on Ali because we're about we're up against a break. We're, we're going to talk about that on the other side of the break. The the book, the first Americans were Africans revisited. That'll be out by the end of March twenty twenty one. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and that absolutely. and that'll be available on Amazon. Is that correct? Amazon, yes, it will. Okay, all right. Stand by. We're up against a break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on nine ten AM, the Superstation. Future Radio on Michael M. Hotel. We're speaking with Dr. David M. Hotel, author of The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, and his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. We'll be back in a few minutes. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365, and Surface Tablet, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. For 25 years, the Black History 101 Mobile Museum has carried on the rich legacy of the Black Museum movement in America by showcasing original artifacts of the Black experience at colleges, universities, K-12 schools, corporations, libraries, conferences, and cultural events, making it the most traversed Black History mobile exhibit in American history. Dr. Khalid El Hakim is the founder of the Black History 101 Mobile Museum, and he is a highly sought after public speaker on topics of black history, social studies, education, museum studies, hip hop and race relations. Dr. Khalid was named among the change makers for NBC Universal's Erase the Hate campaign and listed as one of the 100 men of distinction for black enterprise. He recently founded the Michigan Hip Hop Archive on the campus of Western Michigan University. The Black History 101 Mobile Museum is currently scheduling in-person and virtual exhibits nationwide. For more information, please contact Dr. Khalid Al-Hakim directly at 313-645-4197, 313-645-4197. Or visit their website at blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. That's blackhistorymobilemuseum.com. You can also email him at bhistory101 at yahoo.com. bhistory101 at yahoo.com. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at Cometicwear.com. 
Digital Dandelion's Technical Solutions works with businesses like yours to create an operations manual for your business, which is something many businesses don't have. According to AARP, more than 30% of small business owners are over 50 years old. Many business owners want to retire by selling their businesses or by passing their businesses on to their children. However, according to Forbes Investment Advisors, many retiring owners attempt to sell their businesses for retirement fail. You cannot sell your business without a business manual. Your children also cannot inherit your business because there is no way to run it. Your business does not have to die when you leave. Their business Bible products will give you the tools you need for a thriving business that can make you money even after you retire. Are you looking at increasing your business's annual revenue? Digital Dandelions can help you make at least $100,000 in annual revenue and expand your business. Speak with them today about solidifying your business. Visit DigitalDandelions.com today and get a free 30-minute consultation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation WFDF in Detroit. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, February 21st, 2021, anniversary of the assassination of uh, Malcolm X. We know in our second hour, we'll talk about the press conference that took place uh, on Saturday, February 20th, revealing new information in the assassination of uh, Malcolm X. We know we talked about that on our Friday show. So go back and watch our show from uh, Friday, February 19th, when I gave you a preview of the information that was going to be revealed at the press conference. OK, so uh, I want to uh, give uh, briefly before we bring Dr. David M. Hotel back on uh, uh, a few facts about uh, 910 a.m. Superstation, the history of it, uh, what's going on in 1922. So 910 a.m. was founded in 1922. Um, and there were no refrigerators, only ice boxes in 1922. No, no cheeseburgers, no drive-throughs, uh, no power steering for cars. There was no Ambassador Bridge uh, here in uh, Detroit, between Detroit and Canada. There was no TV, no WXYZ, no WDIV uh, television. We know, and we know WXYZ when it was a radio station. That was the station that the Green Hornet, Sergeant Preston of the Yukon. And the Lone Ranger broadcasted from. I'm an old radio show buff also, so I know all about that. Um, so there was no Detroit Lions or no Red Wings when 9, 10 a.m. went on the air. Some people would say there's no Detroit Lions now, but anyway. Okay, so let's bring Dr. David M. Hotel back on. Let's bring Dr. David M. Hotel back on. <laughs> I haven't watched the NFL game, man, since I think 20, early 2017. Uh, since Colin Kaepernick left the league, I haven't watched the NFL game. I haven't watched the Super Bowl, none of that stuff. But anyway, all right. So uh, right before the break, you were giving us an update on your new book, uh, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. We'll talk about Ali, uh, me, uh, Ali and me in just a minute here. So tell some people uh, what separates the new book from the first book, The First Americans Were Africans, uh, documented evidence. What, what, what are some new uh, discoveries and new things that we're going to see in the new book? Okay, well, here, here we are. Uh, people say that the first um, pyramids were found in Africa. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. They have found pyramids underneath the waters mm -hmm. of every ocean and every sea on this planet. Right. So we're talking about we're talking about a time before the first two ice ages. Now, what period of time are we talking about? You give, you give us, uh, you, uh, as far as years, like what period of time are we talking about? 60,000 years ago? What what are we, what are we talking about? Oh, oh 100,000, maybe maybe um, two or 300,000. Okay, so between two or two? At, at least, you know what, as a matter of fact, um, it would have to be more than 300,000 because that was in Central America. We're talking about um, almost half a million years ago, possibly, possibly even close to that. Okay, so you're talking about pyramids being built underwater about 400,000, 500,000 years ago. Okay. Now, I, I just want to make this clear Go to ahead. some people because when we, I say underwater, I mean, I mean, uh, where I'm not saying that they were in water. Right. We're, we're looking at the lands that are underwater now, okay, mm -hmm. or used to be um, uh, lands with the solid earth on them. 
And and um, in the ice age, what it did was it sucked up a whole lot of that water into a great big gigantic um, mountains of ice, and that's why the the uh, waters of the planet went down for several 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 many many thousands of years. And people went out there and built they built pyramids, but not now. Here's, here's, a, here's another thing that will blow you away even more. I have peer review evidence mm-hmm. that there are pyramids on the moon and there are pyramids on Mars. Right. Okay. And so like so let's let's take this let's take this step by step. So yeah. when you talk about the pyramids underwater, um, so you, you, at the time that they were built, they weren't built underwater. I don't think. There was civilization above ground. Absolutely not. Right, right. So the civilization above ground, but over time, because you have civilizations built on top of civilizations, basically. Yes. Okay. So uh, a, a, explain what, what what happened again with those pyramids that are that are found underwater. You said the ice. The the explain what happened again. That was during an ice age. Two two different. There were two. There've been two different ice ages mm-hmm. in this. On this planet, they know of possibly even three. Okay. But for the last two, they know that you know it froze and and things that froze, you know, in the big blocks of ice, big water level went down. And people lived on there for uh, a couple hundred thousand years and, and built on there, and then slowly but surely, waters came up. And they did that twice. Now we're in, uh, we're in the third uh, flood stage as we speak. Okay. Right. So, uh, and, and and there's some evidence to back this up. Now you you told me about this, and I mean he, he Dr. David M. Hotep and I talk, and a lot of times the information he gives me, you know, I don't talk about it. I let him put it out there. I don't have to jump out here with his information and try to take credit for it like some people do. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. But uh, what <laughs> there was a discovery uh, a few years ago, and I've talked about this on my show before, and uh, you may have heard about this as well um in egypt okay what used to be called kemet they found seven they found 17 pyramids buried underneath the ground they found 17 pyramid Uh you you familiar with that discovery no i'm not okay they found 17 pyramids because i because you know and, and as i explained to my class as i explained to my listeners here all the news outlets um, uh, have this information, whether it's National Geographic, Washington Post, uh, whether it's uh, NBC News, things like this. And if you go to their websites or just Google this information, you'll see this uh, information come up. You'll see these articles on it. And this, this is something I do. So let's look at this just for the, just for the sake because people say, oh, Michael, I'm hotel. You keep coming up with this stuff. We ain't never heard before. We just heard about runaway slaves and, you know, things like that. That is important. You know, that, that information is important. But so let's look at this article here. This is from NBCnews.com. I'm gonna pull this up for people so people can show. I just want people to see because a lot of times, you know, I, I learned this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens. You know, um, I may say some things that outside the circumference of your own awareness, just because you never heard them before, disagree with them, or don't like them, does not mean that they're not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so I, I, I've got this article here uh, up on the screen share this is from nbcnews.com this is not conspiracy theory stuff anything like this 17 lost pyramids discovered in egypt by space scientists 17 lost pyramids discovered in egypt by space scientists um and this this article is from may 25th 2011 okay may 25th okay actually uh malcolm x's birthday but uh <laughs> but um 17 lost pyramids are believed to uh be found in egypt by a team of space archaeologists from alabama according to a report i'm gonna, I'm gonna email this article to you after the show uh, dr david M. Hotel. uh sarah pa- uh, parkax uh p-a-r-c-a-k and her team at a nasa sponsored laboratory at the University of Alabama at Birmingham made the discoveries using a satellite survey and also found more than 1,000 tombs and 3,000 ancient settlements in infrared images 
that show up buildings underground. So what happened was they found uh, using this infrared uh, uh, satellite, and it's something like 430 miles above or something, something crazy like that. Uh, they found these pyramids underground. And at the time that this information came out back in 2011, they excavated two of the pyramids to verify that they were actually pyramids. OK, so this is the pyramids were not built underground. This is an example of civilizations being built on top of civilizations. Now, all the news outlets, I, I talked about this on my show back in 2011 when this story came out and National Geographic has information on it, things like this. OK, so I definitely understand. I definitely understand what you're saying, even though that goes outside, you know, what we normally hear and, you know, uh, African people first came here in 1619 to, to this land and things like that, right? <laughs> but <laughs> I definitely understand what you're talking about. Go ahead, go ahead, because I know you want to comment on this. Yeah, well, um, it's 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 uh, it's like this. Uh, some white folks want this information to get out, and some white folks don't. Mm -hmm. And there are some Negroes. I, I have a I have a difference between black people and, and Negroes. Black folks are revolutionaries. Negroes are ones that uh, uh, I, I, I won't go any further than that. Okay. And the, 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 yeah, I mean, my people understand what I'm saying. Right. What I'm talking about. Right. And we have to understand that. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I'm listening. Go ahead. Yeah, I said right. Yeah. So we have to understand that our, our our children have got to be able to read things like I'm talking about things that uh, that show that they're the Africans were here on this planet before any other people in the, on the, in the world, including the the white race, the so called white race. There's no such thing as race. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right. White folks, or the uh, the or the uh, Chinese, or the so-called American Indians, mm -hmm. okay, who were black in, in the beginning. Okay, Africans. so 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 you said you said the Africans. you said the Indians were black in the beginning. These were Africans. Oh, absolutely. Okay, explain oh, that because 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 for some people this is the first time they're hearing this information. So so explain okay. explain what you're talking about. The 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 first Indians were Africans. Well, I got some photos, first of all, of, of some, some Africans who wear the Indian headdresses over in Africa. Okay, we're, we're in Africa. Uh, you, you remember which part of Africa they're in or which country? I, I don't remember exactly which one. I'd have to okay. go back and look into my, my files. Okay. Um, but, um, yes, uh, so so we're, we're taught that the, the Indians were red, red men. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, you know, these Africans were there, and then later in in life, far later, the the um, Chinese come over, right? All right, right, and they share their blood with the Africans, and that's where they get the the, the so called um, uh, Indian look that we see on TV. So the, the you know so I mean? they're, not, they're not dark. I'm sorry. Right. So Africa. So. Uh, Asians uh, come to this land around 3000 BC and um, the, the Africans and the Asians intermix and they're all spreading of who we call Native Americans. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they have a different look than the Africans. OK. Course. OK. Right. OK. So. Um, so in your new book, uh, you have one of the things you talk about is the uh, discovery with. Uh, in Central America, going back 250,000 years ago of an African presence, 250,000, 325,000 years ago. What are, what are some of the other revelations uh, in, in your new book also? Oh, my goodness. Um, let's see my, my book is 400 pages. Okay. So uh, let's, see, let's see what I can go through. Um, the um, Mayan writing system came before the Olmecs. And we were also taught that the Mayans were before the Olmecs, which is crazy. And then you can go to uh, the Bimini, the Bimini area, okay. Bimini Road. Okay, Bimini, Bimini Road. Road is just, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, Bimini Road is, is a, a phenomenal um, uh, a, a city. Uh, I should say it's a, a phenomenal um, conversation to have because uh, Bimini Road and Andrews Island were once covered and connected. Right. And yeah, and that's and of course as the waters go up, they they're disconnected by the 
rising waters and um, and, and rising temperatures as what's still going on through right today. You know, um, back in, when I was in Baltimore and right now in, in Virginia, you know, it used to snow every winter and we had to smell out all that snow and whatnot. It's not happening anymore. There's no snow to shovel here for the last three or four or five years. Where? It's like that. Where, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no snow. Even more. There's no snow where to shovel in the last three, four or five years. Okay. In, 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 in Virginia? Oh, in Virginia. Okay. And, and down. Okay. Virginia. And I'm in the mountains in Virginia. Okay. I'm in, I'm in uh, yeah. Okay, I I, I I thought you were saying in Detroit. I'm like, no, that's not true. I'm, there's snow out here. There's snow out on the ground right now in Detroit. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Okay. My brother lives in in Texas, and they've had snow in Texas the last two weeks. Mm-hmm. In Texas. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We know in Texas being hit hard. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. That's, um, uh, yeah, that's, way, that's way below, you know, where, where we are now, you know, right. in Maryland and, and Pennsylvania. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, everybody watching on Facebook and YouTube, go ahead and share this uh, broadcast on your social media platforms. We're speaking with Dr. David M. Hotel, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. And he's also telling us about his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. It'll be out by uh, the end of March 2021. And it's going to be available on Amazon.com. We're going to talk about Ali and me in just a second. But you mentioned um, you mentioned uh, peer reviewed evidence and pyramids on the moon and Mars. So you thought I was just going to let that slide. I made a note of it here. So explain that. <laughs> explain, explain, explain that. Explain that. Yes. And that is that we have we have had phenomenal civilizations before. We, we, we've even talked about it in history. Mm-hmm. These these folks either either they're hiding it, or they are they are they they don't know what happened in, in in the last few million years on this planet. Okay, and I'm telling you, there were people here doing things that we did not know about, and that is how did they get to Mars and the Moon? They didn't take the shuttle bus, right? They didn't take Greyhound, right? Okay, right. They flew. And not not airplanes. Mm-hmm. It had to be a missile to go in because you can't take an airplane that far. So so when you uh, explain what peer reviewed is for those that don't know, and his first book is backed up by seven peer reviewed articles. So explain to people what peer reviewed means. Okay, a peer review is is um, is measured by a few um, uh, PhDs. Mm-hmm. approximately 15 or, or so get together and they study a, a, a area or an article or whatnot and they, they see if it is completely un, untouched and, and cannot be disexplained and that is a peer review, something that we know is, 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 is solid in, in, in stone. Okay. okay. So that's a peer reviewed article. All right. And then so, we have other articles that are not peer reviewed. Okay. So the information um dealing with a pyramid on the moon and mars like wh- how, when was this discovered how, how did they come across this explain that it, it, well they, they came across the ones on on mars mm-hmm. um through the the mars uh landing the, the um the, it was not a man man-made landing okay what i understand Okay. It could be. I, I I don't think so. The one on moon was, was because uh, there were people who 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 wanted who uh, who found a pyramid uh, or two on the moon. Mm-hmm. So we know that those things came before uh, our civilizations uh, were even thought about. Right. Right. Isn't that something to think about? Exactly. Exactly. Well, here. well, you know. Black folks, black folks have been here a long, long long time and on mars and in the moon and who knows right. maybe even further back than that well you know I, I i say um when these different archaeological discoveries come out i say that um the deeper they dig the blacker the planet gets the more research they do the older we get the deeper they dig the blacker the planet gets the more research they do the older we get and uh, you, you remember uh, back in like 1999, Juvenile had the song "Back That Thing Up." 
when when these new archaeological discoveries come out, they keep having to back the timelines up. They keep having to back that thing up. And this is what's taking place. They because they uh, when you read these archaeological discoveries, because I read these articles from National Geographic, Washington Post, New York Times, all this stuff, they keep coming to the conclusion all of this stuff is older than we thought. And they and they say we have to rethink everything. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> so um all right. So once again, everybody, um, people will be able to go to Amazon.com and purchase your new book. Uh, it'll be out by the end of March 2021. Now, uh, I, I know for the first book, you had a list of controversial items that gave a brief overview of different things like that. Are you going to have that for your second book? I'm not sure yet. Okay. I, I haven't, haven't yeah, come across that yet. Okay. All right. What do. All right, now you have another book coming out in a couple of weeks called Ali and Me. T tell us about that one. Well, um, there was a young boxer mm -hmm. who boxed his way up to being the the best boxer that anyone has ever heard of, even better than Sugar Ray right. Robinson. Right. And that you have to really go. To, to be better than Sugar Ray Robinson. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was Muhammad Ali. I mean, he, he fought until he was too old to fight. Right. Which was, um, which was when they brought me up because uh, I don't know, he didn't, he didn't know it was time to stop and, and he just kept fighting and um, and he started losing a couple fights, not most, but one, one here and there. Mm -hmm. And he was overweight and uh, that was the thing where he had to ring my bell. Um, he was overweight and they tried to... Um, to get someone to come and help him. And uh, finally, they had 15 or 16 um, folks trying to get the job. And I went over there and applied as well. And, and they uh, researched what my background and whatnot. And I, uh, I was able to, to be the person who uh, will be take, who was taking care of Ali. Okay. And uh, I, had to, I had to take care of his diet, you know. And uh, Lena, a, a beautiful uh, sister by the name of Lena Shabazz, who was his cook at the time and I wasn't I didn't step in her kitchen and, and try to, to change her at all but I was able to change some of the things that they did and then it was add more salads and, and put salad with um, different things into the salad other than lettuce and tomato and um, they also um, the, the great things that uh, that I, that we, we came together by um, having um People eat at all at the same time and, and taking the time and having fun with the meals instead of rush, rush, rush and letting things uh, dissolve in their in their stomachs. Okay. Um, yeah. So Muhammad was uh, was a. I mean, uh, you see, we, we got to go back to yeah, we're going back to Muhammad now. So Muhammad um, um, was a guy that uh, it looks like in his in, in, in his writings that people will be writing from here now they will they will be talking and interviewing other people and they all get the same thing that there is almost no one on this side that didn't like that guy right he was a nice fella well and um, well, what point are you talking about cuz i i know back when he refused to be drafted there was yeah, a ton of right. people ton of people didn't like it now, now what point are you talking about where everybody everybody what point are you talking about where everybody loved him yeah yeah, because yeah. the theory is the theory is once he once Parkinson's took hold and he couldn't talk like he used to and speak out like he used to, then he became lovable. And a lot of people, especially a lot of white people, started loving him. But when he was speaking out against the Vietnam War and and and, and he refused to be drafted into Vietnam and uh, in 1967. And he was calling America on on its hypocrisy. And not only that, you had you had you had Muhammad Ali and Dr. King calling out a, a, a refusing a, a speaking out against the Vietnam War because March 30th, 1967. And it's on YouTube. Associated Press has the interview. March 30th, 1967. Dr. King and Muhammad Ali had a meeting and they were interviewed after the meeting. OK. Uh, and uh, Muhammad Ali spoke about his opposition to the Vietnam War. Dr. King spoke about his opposition to the Vietnam War. Then the following month, April 67, we know April 4th, 1967, Dr. King delivers his speech beyond Vietnam because he, he, he officially comes out in opposition to the Vietnam War. We know he was assassinated exactly one year to the date 
later, April 4th, 1968. And then we know in uh, late April 67, uh, Muhammad Ali is going to refuse to be drafted into the army and is going to end up with him being stripped of his boxing title and suspended for three and a half years till he uh, wins his case in the U.S. Supreme Court. So, uh, yeah, there's a whole lot of people who didn't like uh, Ali uh, back <laughs> Back in uh, uh, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71. Uh, <laughs> right. And a lot of them were happy when uh, a lot of them were happy when in, uh, uh, he came back and fought against Joe Frazier. And Joe Frazier beat him uh, after 15 rounds. Uh, a lot of people were happy. Well, 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 mm -hmm. I was there mm -hmm. at ringside. Mm -hmm. And Ali hit Joe Frazier 11 times to his one. Yeah. Now, well, when you when you are, I mean, he's going brr, 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 just mm -hmm. banging him, banging him, banging him, mm -hmm. and knocking him back. Right. So he was beating up Joe so badly, he started playing with him the last round. Mm -hmm. And that's when he got hit in the jaw. He got, he got knocked down. Right. He got hit in the and jaw. He got back up, and they were said, that's the reason that mm. they say Ali won the fight. Then two more times before, and Ali almost killed him. Right. He, they, they, they fought two more times. He won. That first time... Uh, they, they both were in the hospital for like a month, something like that. They both. Well, Ali left. Ali left. I'm, I'm sorry. A few days. Ali checked himself out. Yeah, Joe was in for three months. Yeah, uh, Ali checked himself out, but Ali was still injured though, because he he was it wasn't the it wasn't the urinating blood. Uh, for for a day or so. Okay. Okay. So, but uh, Ali checks uh, Ali checked himself out. Frazier yeah. was was still in the hospital. He he was he was uh really hurt. Um mm -hmm. and then the, the the next two fights, you know, Ali's going to win the, the next two fights uh that they fight. But yeah, I I remember that he he got hit uh hit in the jaw. What it wasn't the jaw broken in that fight? He was yeah, he was talking. Yeah. He had his mouth wide open. Right. Uh, you know, Ali caught him with his mouth open. His jaw went sideways. Yeah, Joe Frazier called him with it, called him with his mouth open, hit him and broke yeah. his jaw. I right. Mean, because he know he, he knows he had him beat, mm -hmm. so he was chilling and, and, and clowning, and he should have been taking care of business. Right. But the last two rights, his stepbrother took care of business, and Joe Frazier quit that last round, mm -hmm. or, or, or a few rounds. I think it was about two, uh, well, about two, about two or so rounds before the fight was supposed to be over. Uh, Joe just wouldn't come out the corner. Right. And he shook his head. He said, "Uh, -uh I'm through with that." Right. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and, and see, the, the amazing thing about Ali, I'm a huge Muhammad Ali fan. So people watching on Facebook and YouTube, they see the two po uh, pictures behind me of Muhammad Ali. Um, there you go. <laughs> uh, it, it, so the three and a half years that Muhammad Ali was out of a uh, band from boxing, those were the mm -hmm. prime years of a boxer's career. So as great as Ali yeah. was, we never got to see Ali fight in his prime. You know, as as great as as great as Ali was, people have to really understand this. As great as Ali was, because he was banned from boxing, we never got to see Ali fighting his prime. And he was he was he was that good. He was that good where he could be he could be George Foreman. He could he could beat Joe Frazier. He could beat Ken Norton. He could he he could beat all these people. And then in '78, when he loses to Leon Spinks, and we know Leon Spinks just passed away. Leon Spinks, you know, after after he won the championship in 78, he loses it a few months later. And it, it was like a downward spiral, spiral from then. But he comes back, beats uh, Leon Spinks to get his title back, and he, he became the first three-time champion. The first three-time champion, you know. So tell people the name of uh, the, the book about Ali. It's called Ali and Me. Okay. It's long I title. <laughs> Ali and me. Okay, now you were his nutritionist for the la for his last seven fights, correct? Yeah, six fights. His last six fights. For his last six because, fights. Why? Because mm -hmm. well, number one, in that three and a half year layoff, he lost his legs. He didn't. He did not. Uh, correct. He, he didn't either work out like was a, or he aged and three. It was. I don't know which one it was. But right. When he came back, he couldn't dance. He couldn't dance all. Right. Time. He he didn't have the Ali yeah. shuffle. Right. 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 So what he had to do was he had to lay on the ropes. Right. First, every round, some people don't know, it's three rounds. Mm -hmm. for, uh, um, but yeah. So anyway, um, three-minute rounds, excuse me. So the first two minutes, he would lay against the ropes. In the uh -huh. third round, he would come out and fight. Mm -hmm. 
because he couldn't stay on his feet that long. His in, long. In, in, the, in the first, you mean the first two minutes of a round, he would lay on the ropes, and then the last minute, yeah. last minute of the round, he'd yeah. come out fight. Yeah, ropes. yeah. So he became a battling. He became a battling Ali. His his uh. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 probably the best documentary on Ali. I have it on DVD. I think it's called the ultimate Ali or Ali, the ultimate story, something like that. It's a six, it's a six hour, uh, documentary on Ali. So it's on three mm. DVDs. Okay. And, um, wow. and, and they talk about when he left box for three and a half years, when he came back, he didn't have the speed in his legs, uh, how he used to evade, uh, uh, opponents. So then he had to become a battling. He he toughened up and he, he had to become a battling Ali and, you know, uh, yeah. uh, lay on the ropes and things like that and, and take and take more punishment, take more punishment right. also. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how will people be able to get your, your second book, uh, my, Ali and Me? It's going to be, it's going to be um, all my books from now on are going to be on uh, Amazon. Okay. Amazon.com, Ali and Me. It'll be out in a couple of weeks. Uh, 60 pages, and when that comes out, we'll, we'll, we'll bring you back to uh, to talk about that as well. Uh, we're coming up on a break. You got a few more minutes uh, to share with us after the break, okay? Because when we come, okay, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, you speaking to my online class uh, to this Tuesday, February 23rd, and a little bit of the information you're going to cover. So just stand uh, stand by. We got a couple minutes before break. Um, so you so you mentioned uh, you're working on a PhD in nutrition. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I'm done with that. Oh, you're done with after, that? After nutrition, I got with Black History. You said what now? Okay, from Black, from, from nutrition, and Ali died. Right. I went back to school, and that's when I got my, my degree in ancient African history. Oh, okay, so you, you already have the PhD. Yeah. You, already, you already have the PhD in nutrition. Right. Okay. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. So you have two PhDs. Okay. This is a bad brother right here. <laughs> okay. So you have a PhD in nutrition. And then a, and a PhD in ancient African history. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Uh, now, how can uh, do, uh, do you have uh, the, the new website up or anything? I know you have one up for your first book. Do you have a new website up for your second book to promote it? Not yet. We're, we're, we're going to be working on that in the next couple of weeks. Okay. That's uh, right. All right. Okay, we're coming up on a break. Stand by Dr. David M. Hotel. We're speaking with Dr. David M. Hotel, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, and then his new book, The First Americans Were Africans, Revisited, will be out by the end of March 2021. It'll be available on Amazon. It's 400 pages, has a lot of additional uh, research. And then he also has a book coming out in a couple of weeks about his time as uh, Muhammad Ali's nutritionist for Ali's last six fights. You don't want to miss that as well. Get both of them, support this brother. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation Future Radio on Michael M. Hotel. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, some of the information he'll talk about on my Tuesday online class. He's going to be our guest speaker. We'll be back in a few minutes. Visit 4glossygirls.com, that's the number 4glossygirls.com, and follow them on Instagram at 4glossygirls. Digital Dandelion's technical solutions works with businesses like yours to create an operations manual for your business, which is something many businesses don't have. According to AARP, more than 30% of small business owners are over 50 years old. Many business owners want to retire by selling their businesses or by passing their businesses on to their children. However, according to Forbes Investment Advisors, many retiring owners attempt to sell businesses for retirement fail. You cannot sell your business without a business manual. Your children also cannot inherit your business because there is no way to run it. Your business does not have to die when you leave. Their business Bible products will give you the tools you need for a thriving business that can make you money even after you retire. Are you looking at increasing your business's annual revenue? Digital Dandelions can help you make at least $100,000 in annual revenue 
and expand your business. Speak with them today about solidifying your business. Visit DigitalDandelions.com today and get a free 30-minute consultation. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle her hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustler Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Black Beans products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic, personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. Detroit, 9 10 a.m. Superstation, a division of Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9 10 a.m. Superstation. Future Radio. Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Sunday. February 21st, 2021, and we are live. Uh, we're speaking with Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, and his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. And he also has uh, another book coming out about his time with Muhammad Ali as Muhammad Ali's nutritionist for Ali's last six fights. It's called Ali and Me. Uh, let's go back. Let's bring him back on. Okay, uh, Doc, so... I reached out to you to be a guest speaker in my online class, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And it meets on Tuesdays, meets Tuesdays, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you agreed to do that. So give peop- uh, tell people uh, a few of the things that you're going to talk about in uh, our online class on uh, Tuesday. Oh, I haven't, I haven't gotten to that yet. Okay. Um, because all my yeah, all my all my information is I'm 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 spending all my time on trying to get that Doug and Arm uh, Ali book out. Okay. Well, well, some of the things that uh, I want you to deal with are is like the premise of your book, and I know you're going to show some slides and things like that. But uh, the premise being that the the uh, African people were in the Americas before anybody else, tens of thousands of years ago. African people are the original people of the Americas. Central America, South America, and this land also. And you, you're dealing with the Khoisan, okay, who have the oldest yeah. DNA on the planet and go all around the world. Tell, tell us some about the Khoisan. The Khoisan, the Anu, were short people. Mm-hmm. Short statured people. Were, yeah, exactly. Now, these little people are the ones who had built the big, large pyramids all over the planet. Mm-hmm. People don't talk about that. You right. don't hear or see how much anything about that because they won't. They don't want that out. They don't want to talk about pyramids, especially the ones on, on underneath the water or on on Mars and um, and 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 uh, the moon. Right. You know, what do you what do you see folks talk about that on online or even or even uh, any TV programs? There now, are none. now one of the things I want you to talk about in the class are the are the pyramid mounds and the mounds. Okay. 
Um, we know in this land at one point there were like one million mounds. And today, mm -hmm. I think that today they're less than uh, uh, today, they're only about a hundred thousand. Cyrus Thomas uh, talks about this uh, also. So, the these are the Khoisan who built these mounds, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so what uh, explain to people, um, what now one of the one of the mounds, one of the largest mounds that still exists is in East Illinois, East Illinois called Cahokia, Cahokia. And if people look that up, I think it's C-A-H-O-K-I-A, -A, Cahokia. Uh, Professor Kaba Kamene, uh, exactly. Professor Kaba Kamene went there and, and saw it and, and I talked to him afterward. But explain to people, what was the purpose of these mounds? Why were they built? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I do not know. Okay, so we're still we're still trying to figure. Well, a lot of times, a lot of mm -hmm. times they say they're burial mounds, but I'm thinking there was something else going on with with, with those mounds because they they were kind of like special. So that's that's one thing I that people don't talk about. I have not read anything about that yet. Okay, I uh, haven't uncovered anything about you know what's in the mounds other than burial. Okay, so we know that they use them to to bury people, but we're still trying to figure out what was the purpose of the mounds. Now you had you had some mounds the that mounds are out, go ahead. The mounds are out, you know, like, like well, where the pyramids are out. Why why pyramids and why mounds? Why not mounds? All mounds or all pyramids? So you know that's that's kind of that's kind of. What do you think about that, Michael? <laughs> There's still the something that you know, the same the same period. Right. There, there's still some things that we, we're trying to understand why, uh, what was the purpose of some of them, you know, different things like that. Now, there was um, you had like the circular type mounds and then you had mm -hmm. pyramid mounds. Correct. Mm -hmm. OK. Yes, what, yes, what, yes. What, what was the difference between the two of them or like the difference in the structure or what? Have, what was the difference between the two of them? Oh, the total difference. The, one, the dirt mounds were dirt. And the pyramids were of stone. Okay, so the pyramid, the pyramid mounds were made of stone. Okay, and but we they're not mounds. They're, oh, okay. they're pyramids are pyramids. Okay, pyramids are they're pyramids. Not mounds, yeah. Now we know that they're there right. were uh, about one million uh, Indian mounds, which you refer to as Indian mounds, in mm -hmm. uh, North America. Um, now. Let's see. I'm looking at uh, some of what you outlined here in controversial items in um, in uh, the, your first book, The First Americans or Africans Documented Evidence. Um, mm -hmm. you, one of the things you talk about, item number nine, all black Indians were not ex-slaves or descendants of slaves, as as you display on the back cover of your book. All black Indians sure. were not ex-slaves. Or descendants of slaves. So, I I explain that. Okay, there are there are uh, today there are some Indians uh, that who, who were never ever um, made slaves mm -hmm. or or put in jail or all killed. Right. That they they lived on, and and some of them, a few of the tribes were un were undefeated. But they don't right. talk about that. Right now, you 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 met a group of them. Is a group something like thirty thousand of them, or something like that? Possibly. Yeah. Okay, you met a you you met a group. Of, you want to talk about that for a minute? Uh, no, because I don't remember. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. I know. I, I'm not remembering now because I'm seventy. So. Okay, I, I I know you put me in, in. I know you put me in touch with a sister. Uh, and I think her name was Warhorse or something like that. You put me in touch with a sister. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh okay. Brother, let me tell you something. If you yeah. want to know about something, you call Wars. War she's horse. still dressed like an Indian. Right. And she's dark skinned. Yes, she is. She is. So I so you know, I was about to say I talked to her for about I was about to say I talked to her for about an hour, but the correct thing to say was she talked to me for an hour. Because that's what that's what happened. Ah. <laughs> that's what you put me in contact with her. Yeah. So so I, were they down in Louisiana? Um yes. Okay, down in Louisiana, yeah, it's it's something like thirty thousand of them, and there's a it's a it's a whole nation of them. These are these are these are dark skinned African people, yes. Native Americans. Right. They they were never enslaved, and they're down in Louisiana. Okay, 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, I, I, and, and I talked to her for about an hour. I need to try to get in touch with her again. And, you know, you have this history, but w- oftentimes when we talk about African-Americans having Native American blood is 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 only looked at as uh, through enslavement. Because we know the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Cherokee and Seminole Indians, mm-hmm. we know they all owned African slaves. But you, one of the things, one of the things I talk about, and you may deal with this in your book as well, is that when when European settlers come to this land, a lot of the different groups of African people got reclassified as Native Americans, and mm-hmm. and and this is one of the ways you know that our populations get dispersed, uh, our populations disappear because you know you don't know you to understand you know Dr. Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay who has a um, uh, essay in the book of golden age of the moor and he used to teach classes on the history of the moors at temple university um he talks about how to understand to under to understand um the uh where you've been in history or to understand uh what you've done in history you have to understand the names that you've had throughout history okay so this is what we're dealing with there's two names could i interrupt you go ahead go ahead go ahead there's, there's, there's two names we need, need to get straight mm-hmm. native americans and indians are two different groups okay explain that native americans are africans okay they've always been here they are native to this land because they can't they came from another land now they're native to this land okay okay but indians are the ones who were who who were <clears throat> mixed with the, the chinese when mm-hmm. they came over and that's why they're a little, they're a little lighter, mm-hmm. and they have a little different look to their face. But they're they're not white and they're not Asian. They're a mix. They're a mixture of those two. So we we right. have right right. So we have to have a whole reorientation of uh, our understanding of history, and especially understanding yeah, sure. history in this country, because yeah. you know because we so so many of us are just so many of us are just fixated on slavery and thinking all African people who were brought here were slaves or all African people who came here were slaves and things like that. And that's not, that's not the case. Yes. Slavery did take place. You know, no one is saying that neither one of us are saying the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. We're not saying that, but what, what, what I've said, and you say the same thing is that you have to understand like the last, at least 50,000 years of history or even beyond that to absolutely beyond to, to really, to really understand this. Now um, you talk about uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear, Who's a um, archaeologist? Archaeologist at the University of South Carolina, and yes. he 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 made a discovery in uh, 2004 in Allendale County, uh, South Carolina. That and you, and you deal with this in your book. Um, you you want to talk about that for a minute because that ties into the Khoisan. Um, I don't remember that area. Okay, so there was at least I'll pull this slide up because I I talk about it in my. Uh, in my presentations. Uh, so in, in Allendale County, South Carolina, they found um, 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence in South Carolina going back at least 51,700 years ago. OK, uh, so, you, so you deal with this on page 14 of uh, of your first book. Uh, the first okay. Americans were Africans documented evidence. And, and, and just so people know, his first book is backed up by 713 footnotes. But on page 14, uh, you deal with this discovery that Dr. Uh, Albert Goodyear made in South Carolina uh, at a campsite in Allendale County, okay. South Carolina. They, fo- they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. They found 13 different disciplines, 13 different types of evidence, barely documenting an African presence in the territory we call South Carolina, going back at least 51,700 years ago. And these were the Khoisan. The Khoisan had the oldest... And number one Go ahead. thing they found, well, like you said, what you said, Egyptian. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Egyptian writing. So we're talking about the metal netter. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. The okay. Word. Right. So it's important for people to understand the all all of this, all of this stuff, the metal netter, ancient Kemet, the pyramids, they're much older than we've been taught. Is that correct? Absolutely. And that is by design. 
Now, explain that. Why is that by design? Because of white schools and, and most of the, of the black schools mm-hmm. teach the same old BS that, you know, uh, Columbus discovered America in, in 1619, um, the, the Africans were brought here as slaves. And that was the thing that they've been talking about all this time. And now, um, my book is the first one to come out and say that's bullshit. Mm-hmm. Okay, we can't say that on the air. This FCC regulated radio, but yeah, okay, that's BS. Oh, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> right, right. I understand. I understand. So yep, yep. Okay, so uh, speaking of Dr. Albert Goodyear, now there's an article. I, I I don't know if I ever showed this to you or not, but there's an article from Science mm-hmm. Science uh, uh, Science Mag. Let me see ScienceDaily.com. ScienceDaily.com. From November 18th, 2004, this deals with the discovery that he made in Allendale County, South Carolina, that you talk about in your first book. The name of this article, and I want everybody to read this. We have this up on the screen share. This is from um, this is from 17 uh, years ago. Uh, New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago is the name of the the name of the article from sciencedaily.com, which is a scientific website website. They have all types of discoveries there. Um, they have a, this is the summary of the article, the summary of the article, uh, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains, uh, where artifacts were unearthed last May. So it'd be May, 2003. Uh, where uh, artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Okay, Now, this is their summary. This is not my summary. This is not Dr. David M. Hotel's summary. This is what ScienceDaily.com is telling you about this discovery in this, this article is um, 17 years old. Uh, you want to comment on that? Yeah, it's all it's all uh, too early. I'm, I'm sorry, it's all too late. Mm-hmm. You know, when we talk about those 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 are our baby uh, uh, dates. We're talking the ones that I talk about. Like I say, is uh, a million years old. Mm-hmm. African to being over here. Okay, that's that's, that's where I want to get to. Right, right. Well, the the reason why this is important is because this was found here in this land that we call the U.S. And this mm-hmm. totally blows everything out the water of, because the earliest, uh, the, the earliest um, that we were told humans were here was about 13,000 years ago, something like that, the Clovis culture, okay, uh, discovery. But this blows this out the water, okay? So, and, and these were African people, which, causes us to understand that we have to totally rethink all of this. All right. Mm-hmm. Okay. You got you have, you, have, you have time to take a couple callers? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's go. We still have Kwame there in line one. Yeah. Uh, hey, go I'd ahead. Like go ahead, Kwame. You, hey, Kwame, uh, tell us where you're calling from, Kwame. Which city are you calling from? I'm calling, I'm calling from Detroit. From Detroit. Okay. Go I'd ahead like with your question and comment. If you can give uh, a name to the people that built pyramids on the moon and Mars. Okay, if you can give uh, if you give a name to the people who built pyramids on the moon and Mars, Dr. David M. Hotel. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, hello to uh, one of my neighbors because we used to live in Detroit on the uh, almost corner of Puritan Bayless. Yeah. You know about that, that area, brother. You know about so Puritan that, Bayless. Puritan, the corner of Puritan and where Puritan and Bayless come together in Detroit. Well, I know where Puritan is, but I don't, I don't know about Bayless. Okay. Mm-hmm. What else I was? Anyway, um, you want to know what now? I'd like to know who built the pyramids on, on the moon and Mars. Oh, <laughs> there were no other folks around this planet or any other before 50,000, 50, I'll say, um, not even thirty thousand years ago. So okay. these, so these would be the Khoisan also. Years ago, there was, there was nothing but black folks all over the planet, and, and obviously, it must have been all over Mars and Moon too to to have pyramids there. So, because only black folks build pyramids. So, so you know what? 
so uh, just one just one second uh, kwame 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 just one second let me get a clarification so these would be the khoisan as well dr david m hotel yes okay yes okay yes. go ahead go ahead kwame well, I've heard people talk about the builder race and uh this guy named david wilcox he talks about uh people not uh trying to hide the information of the builder race and uh he talks about human beings being all over the universe and whatnot. But uh, yeah, another thing is the Bimini Road is linked to Atlantis, isn't it? That's a uh, possibility, a part of it. But it's, okay. it, it's not It's not the, um, the place. It's, far, it's quite near there. Yeah. It's quite near there. And possibly, again, here again, if the, if the, um, the, <clears throat> the waves and, and, and uh, the site of the um, deepest part of the ocean is is not as deep as it as it used to be. I'm sorry. And now it's a lot deeper than it used to be. Back then, you, know, you could go out from from Miami Beach and you could walk out a couple miles, and there was no ocean because it was it was so cold for so many years. A lot of that of that uh, water got sucked up into icebergs. You see what I mean? And for hundreds of thousands of years, people went out there and they settled out there because, man, that's bored, that's virgin soil. It's the, the hot farmers would, would lose their mind if they could go out there and plant on those, some of those places that have been, um, who, that, have, that have been, um, um, not planted or, um, uh, been able to, um, take all of the different th bones or whatnot that, that sink down to the bottom of the ocean and debris and whatnot just makes, that is soil. So obviously there was a land rush for people to go out there and they did that for hundreds of thousands of years and slowly but surely here, here we go again. Where obviously this is an elliptical, um, orbit that the earth takes around the sun. You okay. See? Yeah. And you know, Andrew Casey made that prediction in 1920s that they would find parts of Atlantis called the Bimini Road. There you and go. Yeah, I think they, they made that discovery in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. All right, Kwame. All right, thank you. Yeah, good. thanks for calling, Kwame. Keep listening, okay? All right, uh, let's go to John, line two. John, we still have John. John, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from, John. We still have John? Oh, we have to get a break. Hold on, we have to get a break. Just a second. Uh, stand by. You listen to the African History Network show right here on the Anton M. Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We're speaking with Dr. David M. Hotel, author of The First Americans Where Africans Revisited. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute. With BlackBusinessTea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business. Know your numbers and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business, encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black-owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. products are a collection of natural, organic, personal care products with an appreciation of nature and bees. Our philosophy is without bees, we have nothing. We are honoring our Nile Valley ancestors who understood the importance of bees. Black Bees created a high quality, natural, organic, personal care line that would be affordable to everyone. Hope you try and enjoy our Black Bees products line and come back and visit us at blackbeesproducts.com. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? 
the cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle Her Hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustler Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that Mother Nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men, women, and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at Soul Natural Beauty Products. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, February 21st, 2021. And uh, we still have Dr. David M. Hotel here for a few more minutes. I realize, you know, time when I talk to this brother, time just it, it escapes from us. OK, the same thing like with Dr. Leonard Jeffries. <laughs> yeah, the same thing with Dr. Leonard Jeffries, man. You know, I, I thought that I thought that Dr. J, uh, it was a few months ago, man. I asked him, how are you doing? It took him 15 minutes to answer that question. <laughs> Because he just got back in the country. Man, it took him 15 minutes to answer that question. I said, all I asked was, how you doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> so when Dr. J come on, man, I got to prep him. I'm like, look, Doc, okay, like we only got this amount of time. And we have a break. We have a break after the 20, after the, after, 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 after 20 after the hour. And I'll get, you got to corral Dr. J, man. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're, we're a double rope. Yeah, yeah, brother. Oh my God. Yeah. Because <laughs> I know, because hey, I. You know, he can, he can, he oh, absolutely. Because I know when he, when when he, um, if you understand his presentation style, he, he'll explain it to you. When he does a lecture, he he'll talk for like an hour, and then he'll say after after talking for an hour, he'll be warmed up. He said, "Now he's ready to start the presentation." So. <laughs> <laughs> Guy, yeah. Guy. But Dr. So, ben, back then was one man. Dr. Ben mm -hmm. was the man. Mm -hmm. Ben Janakaman. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Ben, Dr. Yeah. Yosef Ben Yakanen. Yep. Okay, so uh, once again, uh, Dr. Yeah. David M. Hotel's new books will be out. Uh, first of all, the first Americans were Africans revisited. Everybody's been asking for it. Um, it's uh, by the end of March 2021. It'll be available at Amazon.com. Now, is it going to be in Kindle form? I'm not sure. Okay. All I know is it, it right, right now it'll be uh, in, uh, yeah, yeah, in uh, available on Amazon. Okay. I think I think you said paperback before when I talked to you. It'll be paperback. Uh, it's going to be both. I'm okay. Gonna, I'm gonna have the hardback too. So okay. Good. I'm gonna get the hardback because I I've got the hardback of, of your first book, man. I don't even take this book out the out the uh, house because it's like nine hundred dollars on on Amazon. Cause it's out of print. Um, and then, mm -hmm. and then the second book will be available in the next couple of weeks, Ali and me, Ali and me, mm -hmm. and that'll be available at, um, amazon.com as well. Okay. Yes, uh, we had, um, let me see something here. Do we have, okay. We, we still have John. Okay. Let's go to the phone lines. Let's go to John, uh, line two. Hey John, thanks for holding. 
Uh, welcome to the African History Network show. Tell us where you're calling from, John. I'm, I'm calling from the east side of Detroit. East side of Detroit. You're you going you to be Dr. J for a minute. Uh, <laughs> listen, uh, I want to ask you a reality check. The gentleman on there, did, did you know Africa was, was South America was part of Africa a long time ago? Did, 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 you, ever, did you ever discover that? Did you ever talk about that? And uh, What's Africa? If, 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 really, if you really want to know about the African roots. You go to South America and you can learn a whole lot about the African roots. Yes. So okay. That, so did you hear, the, you hear the first question? Did you hear the first question, uh, Doc? Yeah, I, I did, yes. Yes, um, they were connected. It was all one It was all one piece of earth in the beginning of the, the structure of this planet. And slowly but surely they broke apart. But you are correct, sir. Yeah, and, and, and they... they uh, all of what was reported, I mean, in, in the geography, they only, they only have 360,000 African Americans came to, came to the United States. The rest of them stopped in South America. That, that's what they, most of them uh, well, land in South America and so forth. Okay, so, so you tra you're talking about doing a transatlantic slave trade. Uh, low, esti right. uh, lo 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 low estimates are 388,000. Uh, Africans yeah, were brought yeah, here. Yeah, no, that's right. yeah, it, it, now that's yeah. that's that is what is purported by Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. Uh, that's that's on the low end. Uh, there is other um, evidence. So you're looking at between 388,000 to 1.4 million. Because when I talked to Professor Kaba Kamene a few years ago, he said the information he's looking at puts it at about 1.4 million. However, there's this uh, information. Right. This information that came out in the past few years because uh, I interviewed Dr. Jahi Issa and Brother Reggie Mabry, and we dealt with um, we dealt with uh, a new strategy to get reparations, and that that deals with the violation of federal law when the international transatlantic slave trade became illegal January first, eighteen oh eight. And just for just for people who want to reference the U.S. Constitution, that law went into effect because of Article One, Section Nine, Clause One of the U.S. Constitution, which is a legal argument for reparations. But uh, they they did an article for uh, Black Agenda Report, and the name of this article I'll, I'll pull it up here. Um, it deals with uh, something like reparations. Uh, reparations is dead. New strategy. Let's see. Reparations is dead how to resurrect it reparations is dead how to resurrect it and they talk about new evidence that uh deals with from uh 1808 to 1860 even though it was illegal to bring africans into this country they were still brought in to be made slaves okay uh and right. there, there are court cases of of white men who were arrested and prosecuted things like this for uh still bringing africans into this country so they're looking at uh numbers of somewhere between three to four million something like that still being brought into the country illegally and if you look at um two two examples I'll, I'll let you comment on this here uh if you look at the clotilda the clotilda slave ship of 1860 june of 1860 in alabama when you research the cloak yeah yeah, when 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 you when you research when you research the Clotilda, it was illegal for that ship to come into U.S. waters, and and the man right. the man who uh, owned the ship and 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 had them bring Africans from Dahomey here, he made a bet. He made a bet that he could circum circumvent the uh, federal authorities. And bring Africans into this country. That's why they were brought here. It was because of a bet. Okay. Uh, so research the Clotilda of 1860. And then also when we look at the U.S. Supreme Court case of 1841 of the Amistad. Okay. Now this is this ties into law, which then ties into the U.S. Constitution. Uh, many people saw the movie Amistad from about 1997. Joseph Sinkew and Give Us Free, Give Us Free. But those Africans won their freedom in the U.S. Supreme Court because their U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it was illegal for that Amistad ship to come into U.S. waters because the international transatlantic slave trade had been outlawed uh, in 1808. OK, so it was illegal. So all those all those ships that brought Africans from January 1st, 1808 to June of 1860 with the Clotilda, all that is illegal based upon federal law which is a legal argument for reparations because what they did was illegal. Go ahead, Dr. David M. Hotel. 
Yes, uh, that was a uh, about four. This this man that you all are listening to is filled with some phenomenal information. So you're very lucky to have this, brother. I want to oh. thank you for having me on too. <laughs> okay, well, no problem. All right, John. Thanks for thanks for holding on, man, and thanks for your call, John. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, everybody, uh, be sure to support Dr. David M. Hotel. He needs needs your support. How can people send donations to you, brother? Because I know, you know, now when some people write books, you know, I don't want to call people's names, but some people write books, they get a million dollar publishing deal, you know, with their publisher, something like that, five hundred thousand dollar advancement. Their public their, their publisher sets up uh, uh, sets up book signings all across the country, things like that. But you're independent, so I don't think you have that type of support. So uh, I could be wrong. Maybe you do have that type of support. I don't oh, know. Right. Yeah, <laughs> so how can people, how can people, how can people support you, man? If they want to send a donation or something like that to you, how can they do that? Absolutely. That would be wonderful. Um, they can just uh, write me a uh, Dr. David and Hotep PO box mm -hmm. four, five, zero nine. It's PO box 4509. Mm -hmm. And my the address would be seventeen thirty three Brandon Avenue, B R A N D O N Avenue. That's seventeen thirty three Brandon Avenue, and that's Roanoke, Virginia. Roanoke, Virginia. Okay. And and my zip is two four zero one five, and that's for my postal box. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, that's P.O. Box. What What was it again? P.O. Box what? 1733. 1733. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 45, 4509. Okay. P.O. Box 4509. 45, yeah. Okay. And what's the P.O. Box 4509. What's the street? 1733. Okay. 1733 what? Brandon. Okay. B R A N. Uh huh. He is in David. O N, it's Brand Dunn Avenue. Okay, and that's Roanoke, Virginia. Mm -hmm. Two four zero one five. Okay, two four zero one five. Okay, because I'm post, I'm putting this here on the thread of the broadcast, so people can send a donation to you as well. Okay, so um, any, any of them, anybody wants to send me a donation, we can have a talk about history as well. Okay, all right, no problem, man. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, look. Uh, I know you. I know you have to run. Uh, let people. Uh, can people email you as well? Yes. Yes. What's your email address? Again, my email is my is my name David. Mm -hmm. And there's a period, and my last name M Hotep. M I okay. M H O T is in Tom E is in Paul at gmail dot com. Okay. All right. All right. Well, look, man, I know you have to run. We held you past. Uh, but I have, you, you, you always make time for us. Uh, I was trying to just do an hour, but we went past. So sorry, sorry about that. I know you're busy, but uh, we'll have you back soon again. OK. Thank you for having me, brother. Take all right. All right. And, and uh, OK. OK. All right. No problem, man. Take care. I'll talk to you soon. OK. All right, brother. Hotel. Bye -bye. Peace. Peace. Okay. Yep. OK, so that is Dr. David M. Hotep, author of the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, and his new book, The First Americans Were Africans Revisited. And then also his uh, new book, Ali and Me, Ali and Me. All right, so we're, we're going to switch gears here. And we'll deal with the uh, new evidence that uh, came out in the assassination of Malcolm X. We know the day is the uh, anniversary of the assassination of Malcolm X. He was assassinated February 21st, uh, 1965, 56 years ago. How's everybody doing? Everybody share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. I, I did a few posts today dealing with uh, Malcolm. And for the sake of time, let's see, we're going to jump uh, right into this. So on our Friday show, we talked about the uh, press release from uh, the Benjamin Crump uh, law firm and there was an article from NewsOne.com that uh, talked about new evidence, new evidence regarding Malcolm X's assassination, names, NY, names NYPD as co-conspirators, okay? And uh, then there was a, uh, it, it talked about a press conference that was going to take place, 
place Saturday, February uh, 20th. Saturday, February 20th, that was going to reveal new information. And it deals with a former NYPD officer, New York Police Department officer, Ray Wood, who was uh, tasked with ensuring that Malcolm X, Malcolm X's security detail was arrested days prior to the assassination, guaranteeing Malcolm X did not have door security while at the Audubon Ballroom, uh, where he was assassinated uh, February 21st, 1965. Uh, this deals with a deathbed confession, a deathbed confession. We're going to go to clip, uh, we're going to go to clip one, uh, Jalen. Uh, this deals with a uh, deathbed confession from uh, undercover detective Ray Wood, who infiltrated uh, Malcolm X's uh, camp. Okay, so if we look at the, there was a, there's an article from uh, Black Press USA, Black Press USA that uh, deals with this as well. Deals with this information also. And this is from uh, February 20th after the press conference. Attorney Ben Crump and daughters of uh, Malcolm X reveal NYPD officers' death bed confession of NYPD FBI conspiracy. Okay. We're going to bring up this article as well. But what it says is uh, it goes on to say almost 56 years to the February 21st assassination, uh, 1965 assassination of Malcolm X, uh, the slang leader's daughters and noted civil rights attorney are shining a light on those whom they believe are responsible for Malcolm's uh, heartless murder. Now, the group gathered on Saturday, February 20th at the Audubon Ballroom, and it has since been renamed the Shabazz Center after Malcolm El Hajj Malik El Shabazz. Uh, they were they were there with attorneys Ray Hamlin, Ray Hamlin, uh, and the clips are in the email. The, the clips are in the same email. Scroll down in the email, Jalen. The clips are in the uh, email. Uh, the attorneys Ray Hamlin and Paul Napoli and Reggie Wood. Uh, uh, Reggie Wood, whose relative New York police officer Ray Wood allegedly confessed in a uh, deathbed confession, allegedly confessed in a deathbed uh, confession. Now, the gathering occurred in the same venue as the assassination and just one day before the heinous crimes uh, anniversary. Now, the new allegations focus uh, the new allegations focus on Officer Wood and uh, Officer Ray Wood and a conspiracy against organized civil rights groups that he said had been perpetrated by the New York City Police Department and the Federal Bureau of Investigations. OK, let me know if you found the clips, uh, Jalen. Now, Reggie Wood uh, alleges um, the, the nephew. Reggie Wood alleges that authorities conspired to assassinate uh, Malcolm X in Harlem. He said, quote, Ray Wood, an undercover police officer at the time, confessed in a deathbed de declaration letter that the NYPD and the FBI conspired to undermine the legitimacy of the civil rights movement and its leaders. OK, uh, he said that he said that his uh, uncle, who was who was an undercover police officer at the time, confessed in a deathbed declaration, a deathbed declaration letter that the NYPD, New York Police Department and the FBI conspired to undermine the legitimacy of the civil rights movement and its leaders, uh, said uh, Benjamin Crump. He went on to say, quote, without any training, without any training, Ray Wood's job was to infiltrate civil rights organizations and encourage leaders and members to commit felonious acts. He was also tasked with ensuring that Malcolm X's security detail was arrested days prior to the assassination, guaranteeing Malcolm X did not have door security while at the Audubon Ballroom, okay? 
Uh, now, check out this article here from Black Press USA, uh, blackpressusa.com. So Black Press USA is an African-American news wire. So, you you know, you, you hear about the Associated Press or Reuters, but Black Press USA is an African-American news wire, African-American owned and operated. And it's operated by uh, the, uh, it's operated by the, um, it's a it's an association of African American newspaper publishers. Okay, association of African American newspaper publishers. Um, we're gonna get this. We're gonna get this clip uh, together. Okay, uh, for some reason that stuff did not send when I sent the um, email. Hold on, we'll send it to you because uh, I dropped the clips in there, and for some reason. It didn't come through in the email. All right, just a second here. Uh, I'm going to send this to you. Cue up clip number one uh, from ABC News. Okay, I just sent it to you. So you got the information for tonight's show, but the other information I dropped in below that didn't go through. All right. So Ray Wood's purported deathbed letter. Ray Wood's purported deathbed letter. Um, I'm sorry. Let me back up. So yeah, Ray Wood's purported deathbed letter was delivered to the three to three of Malcolm X's daughters, Kabbalah, uh, Iyasa, and Gamila. Now Reggie Wood, the administration, the, the administrator of his uncle Ray Wood's estate, read the letter to Malcolm X's daughter. Ray Wood served as an undercover New York City police officer with the Bureau of Special Services and Investigation. And uh, we uh, scroll down here in the uh, article. We can see this here. And I'm going to blow this up. I want you all to see this. So what they also talked about at the press conference, and I have uh, the link to the uh, video of the press conference. Uh, what they talked about was also. Ray Wood uh, infiltrating core Congress of racial equality, as well as um, as well as the Black Panther Party for self defense. Okay, so Ray Wood served as an undercover New York City police officer with the uh, Bureau of Special Services and Investigation, also called BOSSI, B O S S I, reportedly. He earned a reputation for infiltrating the Bronx Congress of Racial Equality Corps, the Bronx Congress of Racial Equality, uh, uh, under the name Ray Woodall in 1964. Now, according to a report in The Guardian, uh, theguardian.com, which is a UK publication, Ray Wood posed as a 27 year old graduate of man of manhattan college uh studying law at fordham university okay according to uh the guardian ray wood posed as a 27 year old graduate of uh manhattan college studying uh law at fordham university quote he was soon named cores housing chairman and and oversaw a voter registration project now this is congress of racial equality that he also infiltrated he also infiltrated the black panther party for self-defense as well he was soon named cores housing chairman and oversaw a voting registration project the guardian reported quote Wood earned his activist bona fides by getting arrested with two others at City Hall while attempting a citizen's arrest of Mayor Wagner for allowing racial discrimination on a public construction project, The Guardian reported, which is a UK UK based public uh, uh, newspaper. Now, by 1965. Ray Wood, okay, undercover police officer for the New York Police Department, Ray Wood, had been reassigned 
to infiltrate a group calling itself the Black Liberation Movement, the BLM, the Liberation Movement, and received credit for defusing a plot to bomb the Statue of Liberty. Three men were convicted in the assassination of Malcolm X, Talmadge Hare, who later changed his name to um, uh, Majahid Abdul Halim, um, was the only one to admit guilt in the assassination of Malcolm X, Norman Butler, uh, who later changed his name, Norman 3X Butler, who later changed his name to Muhammad Abdul Aziz, and Thomas Johnson later uh, changed his name to Khalil Islam, uh, they both maintained their innocence. Aziz was paroled in 1985, Islam released in 1987, and Aleem was released in 2010. Islam died in 2009. Okay, I, I want to go to this clip here. This is from ABC News. Uh, this is ABC News, uh, Good Morning America. Uh, they discuss uh, new claims surrounding Malcolm X assassination surface and letter written on former NYPD officer's deathbed. Let's go to this clip. Close of new information involving the assassination of civil rights activist Malcolm X 50 years ago today. It comes from the family of a former NYPD officer in a letter released after his death. And ABC Zachary Keish is at the Audubon Ballroom in New York City where Malcolm X was shot. Zachary, good morning to you. You know, Malcolm Little, Detroit Red, El Haj, Malik El Shabazz, Dan, you can call him whatever you like. Malcolm X was a fearless black man. It made him a prophet for some and a problem, a threat for others. We want justice by any means necessary. We want equality by any means necessary. He spoke truth to power and sought to liberate black Americans, free them from the rot of racism. Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? 56 years after Malcolm X was assassinated here in Harlem, new details have emerged. According to this deathbed note penned by a former undercover NYPD officer, sent to infiltrate and undermine the man and the movement. The letter says both the FBI and the NYPD were involved. Under the direction of my handlers, I was told to encourage leaders and members of the civil rights groups to commit felonious acts. Ray Woods is his name. Lawyers say after carrying the burden of his decisions for decades, the details were placed in the hands of a cousin, Reggie, to be released after his death. He was a good man that was tricked and forced to betray his own people. And he felt guilt and remorse for that for, for 56 years. There have been questions about what happened at the Audubon Ballroom from the beginning. Many have been explored through books and films, most recently in a Netflix documentary. Because the official count of who killed Malcolm X it's not true. Far too many African Americans who have stood up to voice equality and justice in this country have found themselves being persecuted, prosecuted, or in, in the case of Malcolm X, assassinated. The NYPD says it has provided all available records relevant to that case to the district attorney. The department remains committed to assist with that review in any way. Civil rights attorney Benjamin Crum says this is about restorative justice, setting the record straight. This is the only way we can bridge this divide. We have to have transparency, plus accountability, and that's the only way we'll ever get to trust. The DA's office says they're reviewing the case. We've also reached out to the FBI and have not heard back. Now, today, civil rights leaders are drawing a connection between the past in the present. Today, we honor the life and legacy of Malcolm X, a uniquely American story. With okay, so that's from uh, ABC News. That is from uh, February 21st, I think that is, from uh, ABC News. Check that out. Uh, new claims surrounding Malcolm X assassination surface in a uh, letter. Okay, in letter written on former NYPD officer deathbed. Uh, we're going to go to this next clip. Uh, we're going to jump into uh, clip number three. Uh, Jalen, do me a favor, cue that up at about 17 minutes and 30 seconds. This is from the press conference. 
queue it up at about 17 minutes and 30 seconds. I'm going to come to that in just a second. Ben, um, I want to remind people that uh, Wednesday, February 24th, there's a uh, virtual uh, Black History Month celebration uh, organized by Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Uh, so I will be on the panel. It's free to attend. Visit our website, uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And it's right on the uh, homepage. I forgot to uh, make that announcement earlier. Uh, so it's, it's Wednesday, February 24th, 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we're dealing with, uh, it's a, a virtual celebration of African American History Month. You go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the homepage. You'll see information about the my radio show. Uh, we have information about the online course. Dr. David M. Hotel will be our guest uh, speaker. So register for that. Click right here to register for the online course. And then if you keep scrolling down, you'll see information here about the uh, Let's Set Celebrate Black History panel discussion. So the Zetas are, are my sisters. I'm a member of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. This is the uh, Lambda Rho Zeta chapter of Pontiac, Michigan. And if you just click right here, register here, it'll take you to the next uh, page and you can register. It's free. It's on Zoom. Uh, so check that out. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com is taking place Wednesday, February 24th, 2021, 7 p.m. to uh, 8.30 p.m. OK, uh, let's go to I want to go to the uh, press conference from uh, Saturday, February 20th, 2021. Let's go to this clip. From African-Americans. I know this is Andrew Mishar and he contemplated how to do this for many, many days. The day of the problem. And so proudly he gets to relieve this burden and not worry about it being suppressed or squashed because he's doing it very publicly. Mr. Reggie Wood. Good afternoon. I'm prepared to say that you did on behalf of Greenwood and my family. Hopefully, this helps you to understand more clearly uh, where Ray was coming from and also understand what I've been dealing with for the last 10 years after finding out this information. My name is Reginald Wood Jr. I am the cousin of Raymond A. Wood, who was a black undercover New York City police officer in the 1960s. I met Ray for the first time in late 2010. He had been estranged from our family for over 46 years. Ray was aging and experiencing many health problems and had a desire to reconnect with the family before he died. I volunteered to move Ray to Tampa, Florida so that my family and I could look after him. In 2011, Ray learned that he had stomach cancer and wasn't sure how much longer he had to live. Shortly after, he confessed to me a series of detailed accounts of what he participated in, in during his time as a police officer. At that time, Ray told me not to let him take this to his grave, but to please Wait until he passed away to come forward with this information. By 2012, his cancer had gone into remission and he lived until November 24, 2020. For 10 years, I had carried this confession secretly in fear of what 
could happen to my family and myself if the government found out what I knew. He lived in constant fear for over 46 years, worried about what the NYPD and the FBI would do to him and his family if he had told the dark secrets that he had held uh, that helped destroy black leaders and black power organizations. After Ray's casting, I found a confession letter that Ray had written and mailed to my father back in 2011. This letter detailed him, the FBI, and the NYPD involvement in the assassination of Malcolm X. Okay, pause it right there, Jalen. Pause it right there. Okay, those watching on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, keep watching. We're going to keep broadcasting. Uh, be sure to uh, register for my online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, and Dr. David M. Hotel will be our guest uh, speaker on Tuesday, February 23rd. Uh, we're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, WFDF. Remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. Stay tuned for uh, Pastor Greg Davis. Or who, I can't remember who is on now. Uh, I think it's the best Reverend Al Sharpton. Stay tuned for something. And uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow night. You know, we're here six nights a week, okay? We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Peace. Okay, stand by, everybody. Let me disconnect this call. Okay. Let me disconnect this call. All right. All right. We're going to pick up where we left off. Stand by just a second here. Let me try to pick up. Okay, let's continue. You told me not to let him take this to his grave, but to please. Wait until he passed away to come forward with this information. By 2012, his cancer had gone into remission, and he lived until November 24th. 2020. For 10 years, I have carried this confession secretly in fear of what could happen to my family and myself if the government found out what I knew. He lived in constant fear for over 46 years, worried about what the NYPD and the FBI would do to him and his family if he had told the dark secrets that he had held uh, that helped destroy black leaders and black power organizations. After Ray's passing, I found a confession letter that Ray had written and mailed to my father back in 2011. This letter details his, the FBI, and the NYPD's involvement in the assassination of Malcolm X and how he was forced to betray his people. This letter helps me to understand the pain and guilt that Ray felt for the last 55 years. He conspired to help the NYPD assassinate Malcolm X. The false arrests and wrongful convictions of several leaders of court and the wrongful arrest of Black Panther members, including Tupac Shakur's mother, Afini Shakur, which led to her giving birth to Tupac in prison. Unsure how to release this information and keep my family safe, I reached out to attorney Ben Crump, who advised me to place everything that I knew along with this letter into a factual memoir and publish it. By making this information available to the world, everyone will know at the same time, and I will no longer have anything to hide nor can the government quiet me. On behalf of Ray, 
He wanted the world to know that he is deeply sorry. I hope that this information helps the Shabazz family. to more clearly understand what happened to their father on that horrible day. As a black man, I am disgusted to know that what happened 60 years ago is still going on today. We are living under J. Edgar Hoover's Jim Crow system of policing our black and brown people. He is the architect of these constant injustices and tactics against our people. As I stand before you today, I urge everyone who has a voice to speak up and stand up against corruption and systemic racism and policing from the top down. I believe that the United States of America is the greatest country on this planet. And with education, compassion, and the grace of God, we can fix these problems that we are facing. We are the example to the rest of the world. Let's get it together, people. God bless America. I am now going to give a copy of this letter to the Shabazz family. I intend to give a copy of this letter to Khalil Saeed's family, Walter Bowe's family, Thomas Johnson's family, Herb Collinger's family, and Afini Shakur's family. These are the families of individuals that I am aware of who have been falsely convicted due to race actions. I know that there are others that were part of the Panther 21 trial. For 10 years, I've lived with this burden of this secret. I am relieved that I am able to share this truth with the world today. Before I give this letter to the daughters here, I will read the dying declaration letter of Ray Wood. This is the original letter that was sent to my father on February 9th of 2011. I'm going to read a copy. I preserved it for the district attorney and whoever needs this for the court case to be able to exonerate the people that Ray was concerned that had been convicted because of his actions. It's dated January 25th, 2011. I, Raymond A. Wood, being of sound mind and body, wished to confess the following. I was a black New York City undercover police officer from April 1964 through May of 1971. I participated in actions that in hindsight were deplorable and detrimental to the advancement of my own black people. My actions on behalf of the New York City Police Department, Bossy, were done under duress and fear that if I did not follow the orders of my handlers, I could face detrimental consequences. Presently, I am aging with failing health. Recently, I have learned of the death of Mr. Thomas Johnson and are deeply concerned that with my death, his family will not be able to exonerate him after being wrongfully convicted in the killing of Malcolm X. The facts are as follows. April 17, 1964, I was hired by the New York City Police Department. 
Without training, I was immediately assigned to the Bossy Investigation Unit. After witnessing repeated brutality at the hands of my co-workers, in parentheses, police, I tried to resign. Instead, I was threatened with, the, with arrest by pending marijuana and alcohol trafficking charges on me if I did not follow through with the assignments. Under the direction of my handlers, I was told to encourage leaders and members of the civil rights groups to commit felonious acts. The Statue of Liberty bombing idea was created by my supervisor slash handler. Using surveillance, the agency learned that Bo and Saeed were key players in Malcolm X's crowd control security detail. It was my assignment to draw the two men into a felonious federal crime so that they could be arrested by the FBI and kept away from managing Malcolm X's Autobahn ballroom door security on February 21st, 1965. On February 16th, 1965, the Statue of Liberty plot was carried out and the two men were arrested just days before the assassination of Malcolm. At that time, I was not aware that Malcolm X was the target. On February 21st, 1965, I was ordered to be at the Audubon Ballroom where I was to, where I was identified by witnesses while leaving the scene. Thomas Johnson was later arrested and wrongfully convicted to protect my cover and the secrets of the FBI and the NYPD. I had placed my full confession into the care of my cousin, Reginald Wood Jr. I have requested this information be held until after I have passed away. It is my hope that this information is received with the understanding that I have carried these secrets with a heavy heart and remorsefully regret my participation in this matter. Raymond A. Wood. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pause it right there. So what we see here is the infiltration of not just Malcolm's camp, but also the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, the Black Liberation Army, Congress of Racial Equality Corps. That's why, well, read the, uh, I'm going to go back to the article here from um, Black USA, okay? And uh, we'll post a link. Everybody check out this article. Because what it does is it lays out uh, from the um, deathbed confession, it lays out the infiltration that took place. Now, the, 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 it was you have the FBI, the NYPD, other authorities behind the infiltration. They're using him. Uh, Ray Wood through coercion, it appears they're using him as a pawn to infiltrate these other organizations and take them down or disrupt what they're trying to do. Okay. Um, let me see which uh, we'll, we'll pull this up again because I can't find the article again now. And when I'm going to do the the clip here, I'm going to go back to. Uh, the beginning a little bit here because there's a, a part that I want you to hear. Uh, Benjamin Crump is laying out the information that they found. Okay, here's the uh, article. Uh, Benjamin Crump is laying out the information that they found. Uh, but, you know, the uh, Nation of Islam has been blamed for years for the assassination of Malcolm X, but 
oftentimes the agencies that were behind Malcolm's killing were not talked about. Okay. So read this article, attorney Ben Crump and daughters of Malcolm X reveal NYPD officers deathbed confession of NYPD FBI conspiracy. And the NYPD needs to, to come clean with all the information. The FBI needs to come clean with all the information. Um, this is a picture here of the pre, uh, at the press conference. Ray Woods' uh, purported deathbed letter was delivered to three of Malcolm's daughters, Kibala, uh, Ayasa, and Gamila. Uh, and they are pictured here with their attorneys, Benjamin Crump, Ray Hamlin, and Paul Napoli along with Reggie Wood. Reggie Wood's a cousin. Uh, I thought uh, he was a nephew. I may have read something that said he was a nephew, but actually it appears he's a cousin uh, of, um, Reggie Wood is a cousin of Ray Wood, the NYPD, uh, former NYPD officer. All right, so check this out here. Uh, I wanna go back to uh, the beginning here and it was, We'll post a link. You can watch this. Uh, I found the video on uh, YouTube the press conference. Originally, I looked at Ben Crump's uh, website for his law firm. It wasn't there. Maybe it's there now. So we'll see. But I, I want to go back to the beginning here. Man. We're here today to talk about restorative justice. Because the past is prologue. The fact that Ray Wood, this New York undercover police officer who wrote this deathbed dying declaration of his involvement at the behest of the New York Police Department, the FBI, conspired to discredit civil rights leaders, black nationalist leaders, and even worse, to kill them when you consider the assassinations of Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, and Martin Luther King Jr. The past is prologue because just as they continue to enact an intellectual justification of discrimination to justify what happened to Malcolm. They also use the intellectual justification to discriminate today to justify what happened to Breonna Taylor, what happened to 12-year-old Tamir Rice killed in Cleveland, Ohio, to justify the killing of Orlando Castile, the killing of Terrence Crutcher, the killing of Alton Sterling, and so many other names that never received any form of justice after they were unjustifiably murdered. Also, the matter is very revealing and riveting because it talks not only about the conspiracy that they engaged in to kill Malcolm X, it talks about the conspiracy to wrongfully convict the Panther 21 and Tupac Shakur's mother, Afani Shakur, which led to her being incarcerated while she was awaiting trial that she miraculously represented herself and was found not guilty. However, her prince, Tupac Shakur, because of Ray Woods, the NYPD and the FBI, wrongfully and falsely accusing them, her prince, Tupac Shakur, was born in a prison cell. So this is about restorative justice to try to have those black leaders, those civil rights activists who were wrongfully convicted over 50 years ago, to have them exonerated, to have the record set straight, that they were not criminals, but what they were were freedom fighters. And for that, the United States government conspired to discredit them and take away their liberty. 
So even though this is going to be astonishing revelation from the past, I remind you the past is prologue. Malcolm X is Black Lives Matter. Malcolm X is Black Lives Matter. At this time, you're here from a great lawyer, uh, uh, Omega Sci-Fi member, uh, a good man standing for justice with the uh, sisters of Malcolm X lineage, attorney Ray Hammond from New Jersey. Good afternoon. Um, as I stand before you thinking back 56 years ago tomorrow, take a moment to think about being here today and how tragic events of that day tore through the fabric of this community, tore through the fabric of this nation, and certainly tore through the fabric of this family. And the fact that we are here decades later with information from an undercover New York City police officer that I understand will recount or has recounted in chilling detail of his involvement and the involvement, as I understand it, New York City police and perhaps the FBI. Um, the fact of the matter is, the world lost an icon. This nation lost an icon. But the family lost a father and a husband. And as important as it is to the world, it pales in comparison to the importance for his family, for his daughters, three of whom are here. So what we're trying to do, and Brother Crump talked about restorative justice, is as lawyers to try to pursue relentlessly justice. On behalf of the legacy of Malcolm X, Dr. Betty Shabazz, on behalf of his family, his lineage, who is here, and who deserves it more than any of us, and that's what we're trying to do today. So, um, if any of the daughters, so we look forward to uh, this information. Okay, so we're going to pause it there. You can watch the rest of it on YouTube, and they may have it at uh, uh, Ben Crump's um, on his Twitter page. I follow him on Twitter also. And uh, at his uh, law firm's website, check there as well. Okay. So, you know, once again, this is uh, more evidence coming out. And, and then they need to relaunch an investigation into um, dealing with Asada Shakur because the evidence appears Asada Shakur was set up. So that case needs to be reopened as well um there was an article from face to face africa.com that uh, people should check out this deals with eugene roberts now eugene roberts also infiltrated uh malcolm's camp as well also known as gene roberts and I i'm going to pull up this article as well we posted this uh, on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. And it got, um, it got uh, about 2,000 likes, something like that. This is the little known, uh, the little known story of Eugene Roberts. No, I'm not, I'm not going to go deep into it. I'm, I'm going to show it to you. You can read it here uh, because we've already been on for two hours, over two hours, actually. And I have to be back here tomorrow uh, to do the Monday show. <laughs> but it, read this article here. It's a fascinating article from face-to-faceafrica.com. 
Uh, the little known story of Eugene Roberts, the black NYPD secret agent who infiltrated Malcolm X's inner security and the Black Panther Party. OK, and this is uh, written by Michael Dacosi, uh November 20th, 2019, November 20th, 2019, for FaceToFaceAfrica.com. Here's a picture of uh, Eugene Roberts there. And I, I saw an interview with him. I, I think he's in the uh, documentary, how the, the, um, the FBI's uh, War on Black America, something like that. I think he's in that documentary. It's an interview I saw with him uh, years later. But uh, Eugene Roberts, also called Gene Roberts, was close uh, by when Malcolm X was killed at the Audubon Ballroom. In fact, uh, Roberts was photographed trying in vain to resuscitate Malcolm X at, uh, at the assassination. He was a man known affectionately within the organization of Afro-American Unity, an organization Malcolm X founded to bridge the gap between um, African-Americans Bridge the gap between uh, African Americans, uh, between Africans on the continent of Africa and those in the diaspora. He was known as Brother Gene, only later to be confirmed as an undercover agent with the Bureau of Special Services and Investigation, Bossy, and the New York City Police Department, which, which, which is the same agency that uh, Ray Wood uh, uh, apparently worked for. Now, Boss, imagine, well, maybe I shouldn't say this, but you're talking about an agent, and then they show a picture. Uh, they had a picture of uh, Herschel Walker here also. And Herschel Walker testified at the reparations hearing against reparations for African Americans. These, these are some people Harriet Tubman would have at least left on the plantation. But uh, Boss was a super secret political intelligence unit nicknamed the Red Squad when Roberts infiltrated the OAAU, Organization of Afro-American Unity. He managed to become one of Malcolm's chiefs of security while being an NYPD undercover cop. Two of the three uh, men convicted of killing Malcolm X, Norman Butler and Robert 15X Johnson, were almost certainly not at the scene of the crime the evidence points to a confluence of three groups involved in Malcolm X's assassination, uh, institutional forces, NYPD, FBI, CIA. Now, this is back in 2019. This article came out. Uh, the Nation of Islam and elements within Malcolm's own circle after his split with uh, the NOI. Uh, what is clear is that all these groups had a vested interest in eliminating Malcolm X who had at the time of his death become a potent threat to the established system uh, thanks to his mobilization of disgruntled African-Americans as well as the working class, his growing partnership with Ghana, with Ghanaian President Kwame Nkrumah helped birth the, o -O, the OAAU molded on the Continental Organization of African Unity of Independent African States, okay? And... Um, is a picture of uh, Malcolm X with uh, Gene Roberts also. All right, check out the rest of this article here. This is from face to face Africa.com, face to face Africa.com. The little known story of Eugene Roberts, the black NYPD secret agent who infiltrated Malcolm X's inner security and the Black Panther Party. Yeah, watch uh, Eyes on the Prize also. The, uh, the documentary series Eyes on the Prize. Watch that as well. Okay. Uh, be sure to register for the online course that I teach, the eight week, 16 hour online course Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. This is a 16 week, uh, this is an eight week, 16 hour, oh, it's not 16 week. This is an eight week, 16 hour online course that I teach. We deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with uh, what led up to the transatlantic slave trade happening as well. I do a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we have book references. Uh, There's about 50 articles that I reference. You don't have to buy any of the books to follow along in the class. 
Uh, and it, we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We deal with uh, ancient Africa. We deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. So we can't start studying the transatlantic slave trade and slavery. We have to deal with a chronology of what leads to it taking place. And the Moors are taking teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient uh, Egypt into Europe in the Nile Valley region of Africa. They're taking this into Europe. And these teachers are going to bring Europe out of the dark ages, the math, the science, the uh, the agriculture, the uh, chemistry, uh, new ways to make blades and swords, things like this. They also introduced something called a fire stick, which is a long stick that fired one round. That's going to be manufactured into uh, the first gun. Uh, the, the, you see the first gun manufactured about mid uh, 1300s in Europe. But it's based upon technology the more is taken to europe as well they're taking in musical instruments all these things they're teaching europeans how to read how to write how to bathe all this is going to come back and kick us, kick us in the behind so when you go to our website africanhistorynetwork.com you scroll down the page you see the information for the online course click right here to register and it takes you right here uh to a page and click right here on enroll so it's on sale 80 dollars regularly 130 and you can uh, watch from around the world. You can watch classes over and over again. So if you miss anything, you can go back and watch it. OK, as soon as you register, you can watch uh, the class from this past Tuesday when we had Sister Nubia Watford, the cultural anthropologist, as our guest speaker. And there's also bonus content there you can watch as well. OK, and we'll post a link here um, uh, again also. Uh, we also have the uh, 15 DVD bundle pack, the Black History Month uh, 15 DVD bundle pack at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's uh, the Mind Hotel 15 DVD bundle pack. So when you scroll down the page, uh, below the information for the online course and below uh, where I'm speaking on the 24th, you see it here. It's a, uh, it's a 15 DVD bundle pack of uh, lectures I've done. It's on sale $100 and it includes uh, presentations dealing with the film Black Panther. Uh, it includes uh, uh, presentations dealing with the origins of African-American History Month and, and Dr. Carter G. Woodson. All that's in the bundles, a 15 DVD uh, bundle pack. We have it on digital download also. OK, we have these orders shipping out this week. And there's three lectures dealing with the film Black Panther. That uh, The first one is almost a three hour presentation, Black Panther Analysis, African History, Culture and Afrofuturism. I did about three months of research on the film Black Panther and studying the history of the Black Panther comic book so I could do these presentations. Uh, then also you have uh, having dealing with uh, Malcolm X, uh, Dr. King, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the revolutionary, will not be televised on the television. Uh, there's another, there's one here dealing with uh, Black Panther, lessons from the film Black Panther. Uh, economic guerrilla warfare and political self-defense. How do we take the enthusiasm from the film Black Panther and use that for economic empowerment and political empowerment? This deals with the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787 and the history of the Electoral College. Uh, this is a double lecture I did with Dr. David M. Hotel back in 2013. And he dealt with the first Americans were Africans, documented evidence. I dealt with great African women in history, the mothers of civilization. So we have some other presentations in here also. It's a 15 DVD bundle pack. Um, Black History Month bundle pack. And, and one of the presentations you get is Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization. So I deal with some well known African women and some not so well known from all different time periods. Okay. So that's available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We'll post the link here for the uh, online course so you can register for that. And then uh, also the uh, DVD bundle pack and all my lectures are at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We also have some of them in uh, digital download format as well. OK, today is Nina Simone's birthday. Uh, we'll, we'll talk some more about Nina Simone. On our on our Monday show. Um, so brilliant sister, everybody remembers the, the song Mississippi. Goddamn, everybody remembers that um, she's part of the civil rights movement uh, as well. Uh, Nina Simone, let me pull this up here. We posted about it uh, from the National R&B Music Society, Inc. We posted about it on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Okay, so remembering Eunice Kathleen Wayman, known professionally 
as Nina Simone. She was born February 21st, 1933. She passed away April 21st, 2003. And she was a singer, songwriter, pian uh, pianist, arranger, and activist in the civil rights movement. Her music spanned a broad range of music styles, including classical, jazz, blues, folk, R&B, gospel, and pop, okay? So we'll talk some more about um, uh, Nina Simone on our uh, on tomorrow's show, as well as uh, Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier just had a birthday. Um, also, it was uh, February, I think it was February 20th for Sidney Poitier. He turned uh, 94 years old. Uh, yeah, February 20th, February 20th, 1927, uh, Sidney Poitier was born. So we'll talk a little bit about Sidney Poitier as well. And we'll talk some more about Malcolm X also. Hey, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Now, if you donate through Cash App, be sure to type in dollar sign the AHN show because somebody set up a fake African History Network cash app uh, account, which is similar to mine. There's is the, there's a similar to mine. And uh, mine says Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L dollar sign the AHN show. That's mine. Uh, so I have to take some action on this fake one. I just found out about this past week. Um, so I don't know who the hell did that, but I'm going to find out. Um, so, and then mine, you see my picture up there also as well. Uh, and then on uh, PayPal also, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So you can check that out. Okay, it's at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. Okay, so see mine, this is what mine looks like. I don't know if you can see this, it's, uh, but it says, Michael Dollar signed the AHN show. There's a glare here, but uh, that's mine, and it has my picture there. These other people took my logo, the AHN logo with the black background, put it up there, set up this fake Cash App account. So if you've donated to that fake Cash App account, contact Cash App and get your money back. If you donated to that fake uh, African History Network Cash App account that's out there, okay. And and there and there's a dollar sign the AHN. Mine is the AHN show. That's why I said type in the AHN show. If you donate to that fake African History Network Cash App account, contact Cash App and get your money back. Because uh I found out about this this past week. Somebody was trying to register for our course. They want to send it through Cash App. She accidentally sent it to these fake ass people. And I found out about it and told her what to do. And she contacted Cash App. And she got her money back and was able to send it to us. All right. So uh, just keep that in mind. If you have any questions, email us at AHN show at African History Network dot com. AHN show at African History Network dot com. All right. Look, we have to get out of here. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Peace. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting, LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. 
what happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle her hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustle Her Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. With BlackBusinessTea.com, the messages are clear and meaningful. Keep your business in the black and out of the red. Mind your black business, know your numbers and plan strategically. Black business boss, lead your industry. Support black business, encourage, patronize, and uplift one another. BlackBusinessTea.com currently has products sold in Detroit, Atlanta, Chicago, and Los Angeles with proceeds returned to the black community. They have a wide selection of hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, hats, sweatshirts that support black owned businesses. Visit the website blackbusinesstea.com. That's blackbusinesstea.com. Do you have an idea or business that requires app development or thinking of moving your IT resources to the cloud? We have post-paid and profit-sharing plans for unique ideas or profitable businesses. Who can take advantage of this unique program? Entrepreneurs with unique ideas, startups, small to medium businesses. Contact us, 267-209-0352. Visit nomadicsystems.net, nomadicsystems.net today. Intuitive Design Clothing is an online accessory store that sells one-of-a-kind signature statement pieces for men and women. They also specialize in fashion consultations, closet organization, and decorating small spaces. Are you looking for a statement piece for a special affair, or would you like to add some select pieces to your ensemble of accessories? If you're looking for something different, definitely contact Kitty Norman owner and CEO of Intuitive Design Clothing. Visit their website, intuitivedesignclothing.com. That's intuitivedesignclothing.com. And you can email her at info at intuitivedesignclothing.com. Intuitive Design Clothing is where every entrance is a grand entrance. Soul Natural Beauty Products offers organic, plant-based skin and hair care products that will rejuvenate skin and naturally grow and thicken hair. Their whipped shea butter can heal or restore damaged skin cells to prevent hyperpigmentation and skin breakouts. All products are made with organic plant-based ingredients. Their maximum hair growth oil is fortified with organic herbal extracts and undeniably proves that mother nature knows best. It thickens, lengthens, softens, and conditions all types of hair. They even guarantee hair improvement within 90 days or a full refund. Their all-natural 24-hour deodorant leaves the body smelling fresh without sweating for up to 24 hours. It does not stain fabric, goes on smoothly, and has a refreshing lavender and frankincense aroma. It can be used by men, women, and even children. Place your order today at SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. That's SoulNaturalBeautyProducts.com. And follow them on Facebook at Soul Natural Beauty Products. Yaya Rule is a line of African print-inspired apparel catered to the black community. The pieces include t-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, jackets, dresses, skirts, activewear, bags, and other accessories and home decor. This brand offers a revived way for men and women to wear their black pride and honor their African heritage anywhere at any time. This apparel line is for anyone 
whether you are working in the corporate world are an entrepreneur or an artist their selection will allow you to casually let your pride shine or dress it up as wanted it is for those who have already embraced african fabrics and for those who are just getting introduced to them reclaim and experience a part of our culture with rich and colorful african prints the clothing line and the accessories are available right now starting at 17.99 for more information on the new items and accessories, visit yayarule.com. Are you getting ready for fall or winter? We have the solution for all seasonal clothing needs. Cometicwear.com is the go-to online source for Cometic African fashion and lifestyle products with a contemporary twist. We're committed to offering unique styles reflecting our African heritage. Cometicwear.com is inspired by Cometicscribes.com to influence our people in learning and showing pride. Please visit our website at cometicwear.com.